Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the many gifts that you give us, the grace that you give us again this day. We pray for your blessing as we study your word, that you might strengthen our faith and our commitment to you. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, looking back in the files of something we haven't done in quite a while, we've been through virtually every book of the Bible since I've been here, 26 years, 27 now, going on 27. February 94 I came, so what does that make? 27, All right? Anyway, pastors aren't mathematicians. So we've been through pretty much all the books of the Bible. Um, Romans we did a long time ago, so I thought it would be good to go through now, especially since um, I've, I've kind of learned a lot of stuff about Rome that I think helps, makes more sense of Romans to me anyway, that hopefully I can share with you as we go along. And in fact, I'm supposed to give a presentation in San Antonio in April, again on this topic, what Christianity was like in Rome in the first century, how, how Christians faced the, the whole uh, Roman culture of immorality and everything. So we are going to look at Romans. And this morning is primarily going to be background material uh, before we actually get into the book itself. So let's start on your handout then. Divided this up into three main sections. Paul's personal circumstances, Rome's circumstances, and Rome's attitude towards Christians. So you understand a little bit when Paul writes to the Romans uh, what their life was like when he was writing to them. So first of all, Paul's circumstances. Uh, Paul had begun his ministry. He had gone on a couple of different missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire, establishing congregations in cities like Ephesus and Corinth and Thessalonica, cities that were at one time Greek cities, but had now been brought into the Roman Empire. Uh, cities where there was a small Jewish population, but where there, a lot of the converts were Gentiles. So, just prior to writing Romans, Paul spent two years in Ephesus uh, teaching and preaching. And if you look in Acts chapter 19, you will see a reference to this. Acts chapter 19, verses 8 and 9, Paul talks about this. So he went into the synagogue, this is in Ephesus, Paul did, and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the words of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So initially in Ephesus, he's given three months in the synagogue to teach. The Jews rise up against him, accuse him of heresy and false teaching. He leaves with the people who are, who are believing his message uh, and teaches in the, another setting that's not in the synagogue for two years. There's two years, yes. Um, so there was, it, it, but even here in Ephesus, it was tension-filled because obviously there was a faction that was hostile towards Christianity, and it was probably the Jewish faction. So it's at the end of this two years of instruction that Paul kind of makes up his mind he's going to get moving again and start visiting places. Acts 19, 21 to 22, we hear that Paul wants to go uh, to Rome. 21 and 22, chapter 19. When these things were accomplished, Paul proposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must see Rome. So he sent to Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a time. One of the things Paul is doing when he's traveling is raising money. 
Uh, you don't normally think of Paul as a, as a fundraiser, but he was. He was raising money for the church back in Jerusalem, collecting it from all these little churches throughout the Roman Empire and then taking it back to Jerusalem because the, the Christians in Jerusalem were dirt poor, starving to death. So Paul was raising money for them. So part of the reason why here he wants to go back to Jerusalem is to bring those monies to the people in the church there. Um, and then after that, he wanted to go to Rome. He hadn't been there yet. Uh, back on the handout. So it was probably about this time when he wrote to the Roman Christians and told them of his desire to come and visit, uh, which means that it was during this period uh, yeah, of roughly 55 to 56 A.D. when this was written. So if you look in, in Romans now, chapter 15, 22 to 29, you will see a reference to that. Romans 15, 22 through 29. Again, he has not been to Rome yet. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make certain contributions for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Uh, therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit. I shall go by way of you to Spain. All right. So Paul wants to come, and there he explains this collection that he had taken up for the, the poor people in Jerusalem. So all of this kind of fits together with, uh, with Paul going there. But the letter to the Romans, most of the other congregations that Paul set up in these other towns, he personally set up. And he went there and he found Jews and started teaching in their synagogues and formed a Christian congregation. Rome didn't work like that. Rome was different. There were Christians there without Paul, without any disciples having, having been there to establish a church. Uh, undoubtedly, these Christians had learned of Jesus, maybe even from the apostles elsewhere, and brought it back to Rome. Uh, but a disciple did not personally start the congregation in Rome. All right, any, th any questions thus far? What would have the size of Rome been at this time? That is a good question. I think, from what I've read, um, the city of Rome itself in the ballpark of a million. Um, a million men, I think, is what I read. So on top of that, women, children, and slaves, which made up a huge part of the population. Slavery was pervasive. Slaves were everywhere. And they weren't just, they weren't one race. You know, they were all races. All right. So, now, Rome's circumstances. In 63 B.C., Pompey laid waste to Judea and expelled many Jews. These Jews were taken to Rome as slaves. But once there, they worshipped together and formed synagogues. By the first century, there's evidence that 12 or 13 different synagogues were present in the city of Rome. So yeah, the, the first Romans came, or first Jews came to Rome as slaves. Uh, but the Romans allowed them to worship. Part of the reason why the Romans allowed the Jews to worship was because they, uh, they, they had a, what they called an ancient religion. Uh, it was old. They had a established scripture, established uh, ways of, of uh, worshiping that were all, you know, acceptable to the Romans. So the Romans allowed Jews to form their little synagogues, even though they were slaves. 
slavery in Rome wasn't like we think of slavery with, you know, American slavery. They didn't, they didn't necessarily chain their slaves up and beat them mercilessly. I suppose some slave masters might have. But by and large, slaves were given free reign to Rome society and, you know, they were everything from bookkeepers to, to day workers. And you had a, a weird combination of slaves working side by side with free people on the, the same jobs, you know. So slavery was not always the abusive sort of thing it's portrayed as. So the Jews were slaves, but slaves enough that they had free reign to form synagogues. And 12 or 13 synagogues is a lot. Now, yeah, we'll, we'll get to this in a bit. The, uh, next asterisk. The first mention of Christians in Rome is under the Caesar Claudius, 41 to 54 AD. Uh, Suetonius, that's a, a historian, he wrote, as the Jews were making constant disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he expelled them from Rome. Now, Crestus is undoubtedly a reference to Christ. Uh, which, you know, all he, heard, all he heard was a name and didn't know anything else about it, so he, he mispronounces it. But Claudius expels the Jews from Rome because of disturbances that Christians were making. Christian Jews, particularly. You, what in the world could those disturbances have been? It doesn't say specifically. If you look in Acts now, chapter 18, verse 2, you see a reference to this actually happening in the New Testament. So Acts 18, 2. Uh, we'll read Acts 18, 1 and 2. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So here's one of those instances where something biblically, a biblical historical event, actually has concrete evidence in secular sources. Uh, Suetonius was no Christian uh, and didn't even know about this reference in Acts. So he writes why Claudius kicked the Jews out. It was because of Christ. We will discuss as we go along here what it could have been about Christians that made them cause disturbances. Uh, here's just a note about Claudius. Uh, Claudius was the first Roman emperor made Caesar by action of the Praetorian Guard, which is basically Rome's secret service. Uh, they found him hiding in his residence behind a curtain after the assassination of his predecessor, Caligula. He didn't want to be Caesar out of fear of assassination by insistence of the Praetorian Guard, and the Senate confirmed his empire. So yeah, what, right before Claudius is made Caesar, they had Caligula, who... Uh, who History records as being an utter monster of a human being. Uh, Caligula is assassinated by his own guard. <laughs> the seek, imagine the Secret Service just plain killing the president because he was so corrupt. That's what happened. They just, they just killed him. Um, they, there was a price to be paid for that. The, the main assassinators among the Praetorian Guard were put to death for it. But once Caligula was dead, they decided they didn't want his family around either to, to possibly continue his legacy. So they also killed his child and his wife. So Claudius, who was royal blood, he heard about the assassination of Caligula and immediately tries hiding. He was, he was a weird guy. He was weird enough that there, the historians at the time said that people back then at first thought he might be mentally disabled. He wasn't your typical Roman. Um, and he's actually turned out to be very scholarly. He wrote a, a whole history and, and, and was the last person supposedly capable of, of reading 
I think it was Etruscan, but, but some Roman dialect, ancient dialect. At any rate, the Praetorian Guard goes looking for him. They find him hiding behind the curtains because he just heard, hey, they killed Caligula, you know, now they're coming for me. He thought they were going to kill him. So they catch him cowering, drag him off to the, the Praetorian camp, keep him safe there, protect him, and then the Praetorian guard goes to the Senate and says, we've got, your, we've got the next Caesar. And they, and they told the Senate who they're going to elect. So the Senate really didn't get to elect who they wanted to. Uh, so at any rate, that's how, that's how Claudius becomes Caesar. Uh, uh, in Suetonius, Suetonius wrote a book called the, uh, the First Twelve Caesars. And in this book, he says Claudius was the only one of the first twelve Caesars who did not really like having homosexual liaisons with other men. <clears throat> Eleven of the twelve other ones evidently didn't mind that and engaged in it regularly. Claudius was liked women. Uh, so much so, I think he married five times, including his niece once. Uh, and had you know, many other horrible things like that. So <clears throat> that's Claudius. And Claudius takes offense at these Jews uh, who were being instigated by Crestus. All right, next asterisk. Along with this decree to evict Jews from Rome... Claudius had earlier, 41 AD, issued a decree forbidding Jews from gathering for worship. Because most of the early Christians were Jewish, this edict applied to them. And this may explain why house churches were found in Rome. So look in Romans, again, Romans chapter 16. Now, there were no Christian churches, per se, at this time. But the Christians did originally, and in these, in these other cities where Paul would find them, they worshipped in the synagogue with the Jews, side by side with the Jews. So Romans 16, verse 5, you see a reference to this. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved, etc., etc., and then... Uh, if you look at other verses, he mentions greeting this or that person or their household. Verse 11, uh, greet Herodian, my kinsmen, greet those who are of the household of Narcissus. All these different households, he mentions. Verse 14, uh, let's see, the brethren who are with him. These are all thought possibly to have been different house churches not just households, not just families. When he says household, he means Christian church meeting there. So the house church was only a temporary little thing that happened for primarily in these cities where Christians were either booted out of the synagogue or here in Rome where they were forbidden from gathering and worship. So they would just kind of, hey, let's meet at our house and have a, you know, have a potluck. But then they worshipped on the side while they were all together. Uh, when I had my a knee surgery, that was a long time ago, in Iowa, uh, in, in Ames, so it wasn't that long ago. 20 years? 15 years? At any rate, my, uh, my knee surgeon at the time, who knew I was a pastor, felt compelled to tell me how he house-churched. You know, if you heard of homeschooling, well, he home-churched. Uh, it's actually a thing. I looked it up online. There's actually, like, there's association of homeschoolers. There's a whole, a whole so association of house churchers, too. Which is ridiculous, because the house church thing that it mentions here was only done for this sliver of period of time because Rome had forbidden them from gathering together in churches. Just a convenient way to, you know, believe whatever you want to believe because you're not subject to any, any doctrine. All right, going on. Next asterisk. Last asterisk before the Roman culture section. 
It's thought that the number of Gentile converts in Rome and therefore Gentile members in the church in Rome was greater than in many of the other newly formed Christian churches. Now that needs to be remembered. Because in the next section, when we look at Roman culture, that's the Gentile culture that the converts are coming from. And that also means these, these people are bringing all of that baggage with them when they come into the church. When it comes to things like homosexuality in our day, the church tends to treat them differently, like they're diseased in some way. You know, people don't always extend a hand of friendship out to someone who might be struggling from same-sex desires the same way that they would with someone who had, you know, known to commit adultery with someone of the opposite sex. Uh, there's a, we've placed a stigma on that particular sin that we, we really, it repulses us. In Rome, these early Christians, many of them, many of the male ones especially, very well, the Gentile converts may have at some point in their life been engaged in that sin because it was part of their culture. So a lot of these early Gentile converts probably had a lot of sexual abuse in their background uh, and even you know, horrible sexual sins in their background, along with horrible paganism and idolatry and everything else. So they had to be very welcoming Christians, you know, very forgiving and gracious. And it's a good lesson for the church today, actually. All right, now to the Roman culture section. These are the people that the gospel is coming to. Roman culture was defined by idolatry. There were hundreds of temples to hundreds of different gods in Rome. Uh, kind of the, the way Rome worked, when they would conquer a land or a people, they would very often incorporate the false gods of those people. They would allow those religions to continue to worship as they were and wouldn't try and change them and allowed them even to bring their their gods to Rome and set up little temples and things. <clears throat> so Rome had temples to Egyptian gods, to the Greek gods, uh, to the Roman version of the Greek gods, uh, on nearly every street corner there were temples. Uh, and over all of it were the Vestal Virgins who worshiped the god Vesta a group of seven women who were the, the high priestesses over all temples. In fact, they made something called a, it, it, it was a, a, a grain, a flower, that, that they made uniquely that had to be sprinkled over every sacrifice offered to any of the other gods in Rome. So they, they kind of were the, de facto high priestesses over all of the false gods. And they also, the Vestal Virgins, kept a fire uh, in the worship of Vesta that every sacrifice, in fact, every fire throughout the city of Rome was to be started by taking from the hearth fire of the Vestal Virgins. So every sacrifice was touched by the Vestal Virgins by the, the god Vesta. Uh, and they had, a, they had a good, uh, other than that whole, you know, couldn't get married or have children thing. Um, they were extremely, they were, they were probably the most powerful women in Rome. <clears throat> they, were, they were among the few women allowed to go to virtually all of the events except the Senate in Rome. Um, if, they, if you were a prisoner and a Vestal Virgin touched you, you were set free. Uh, they had the best seats in all of the entertainment events. So, yeah, it wasn't a bad gig. 
Uh, but if you broke that virgin thing and were caught with a man, the punishment was execution by being buried alive in the walls of Rome. Howed a little room out for you, put you in there, sealed it up, and you either suffocated or starved, whichever came first. Which happened a couple of times. Uh, by the way, the last chief Vestal Virgin was a woman named Celia Concordia who converted to Christianity. And at her conversion, the Vestal Virgins collapsed forever. All right, Pat top of the next page. <clears throat> All right, so we have this extremely idolatrous culture. Uh, the Emperor Gaius, also known as Caligula, which I just recently found out means little boots. <laughs> His parents, as a kid, took him to a, a military camp and put little military boots on him, and so he got the nickname Caligula, which means boots. So not a very terrifying, you know, Caesar's nickname. Here comes boots. Uh, at any rate, he had a golden idol to himself installed in a temple dedicated to his own worship. He had his idol dressed in whatever clothes he wore for that day and a priesthood dedicated to leading worship and making sacrifices to himself. Now there's an, there's an ego for you. Uh, but the, if the Vestal Virgins were the high priestesses in Rome over all religions, Caesar was considered the high priest over all religions. He was a god or a son of God. And a lot of Roman coinage, and this started with Julius Caesar, a lot of Roman coinage bore the image of, of the Caesar on, on one side, and over it, it, it actually said son of God. And, and it was on a denarius which when Jesus asks for a Roman denarius to be given him, and then he says, when the question is posed to him, should we pay taxes to the Romans or not? He asks for a Roman denarius. They give him one. He said, whose image is this? They said, Caesar. And Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. When he says that, he's actually making a very risky dig at Caesar because the Roman coin said Caesar, son of God, on it. And here Jesus is saying this isn't God. Render to God the things that are God, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So Jesus is making a distinction between Caesar and God that the Romans didn't make. It's actually a very subtle, very clever way of saying Caesar is not God. God is God. All right, um, next asterisk. Idolatry permeated every aspect of Roman culture, every sporting event, every Senate assembly, every public play and entertainment was begun with prayers and sacrifices to the gods. So Christians did not participate or attend these public events. The way the Christians witnessed to the truth was by keeping themselves away from the idolatry not by participating in it and then trying to put a Christian spin on it. You know, like, like we had in the Missouri Synod a number of years ago, after 9-11, when they had this giant prayer service to whatever God you wanted in Yankee Stadium, and one of our district presidents participated in it. And they all took turns praying to their own God. That is the exact opposite the way this should have been handled. It should have been utterly boycotted because it was idolatrous from the get-go. And Christians don't participate in idolatry. We never have. So Christians got a reputation as being standoffish. They didn't participate in the things that everybody else did. They were weirdos. One foreign traveler wrote home that Rome was the most religious city on earth because everything centered around their gods. Next, sexual immorality was also part of first century Roman culture. Pedophilia, bisexual intercourse among men, prostitution and intercourse with one's slaves were common and socially acceptable. 
And then, as I said before, of the first 12 Caesars, only Claudius is said to have had a distaste for intercourse with men. No, I didn't finish this sentence about Tiberius. Um, Tiberius, who was the guy, the, the, the first Caesar is Julius, then Augustus, then, I think it's Tiberius, after Augustus, then Caligula, then Claudius. No. Yeah. Tiberius was a sexual monster. Um, he had an island resort on the island of Capri where he had, uh, there was a woods on this island and stuff, and he turned it into a, a kind of um, storybook fantasy with nymphs and fairies and things like that living in the woodland where he hired basically prostitutes to dress like fairies and woodland things, and his guests could go into the woods and engage you know, with various things with them. Um, he's also said to have abused minors regularly on Capri, and then for fear of them possibly telling others and bringing shame on him, he would walk them. Capri was on top of a cliff. He'd walk them to the edge of the cliff and push them off. Uh, there's a report of how when he swam in his swimming pool, he actually hired small children to swim with him and, and you know, nibble on his private parts while he was swimming. He was a sick, sick human being, so sick that a neighboring king of Bithynia wrote him a letter suggesting he should just kill himself and save his people, you know, the, 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 the misery of living under him. He was a monster. Tiberius was the Caesar in place when Jesus is crucified. That's the Caesar that the Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. You know, crucify Jesus, he's not our king, our king is Caesar. The Jews preferred that monster Tiberius to Jesus. That's how intense their hatred was of Christ. So, yeah, Tiberius, Tiberius was a monster. Caligula follows him, who was worse, if you can imagine. Uh, it's rumored, although never proven, but a, an ongoing rumor that uh, Caligula helped poison Tiberius, he and his mother, so that he could take the throne. That was a common thing, too. Being a Caesar, you were always under risk of being assassinated. And poison was a common way of doing it. Caligula was stabbed to death, so he broke with tradition that way. Uh, Julius Caesar, the first one, was stabbed to death by his Senate. Uh, Augustus, the one after him, actually wasn't murdered, but many of the others were. All right, <clears throat> so that is, that's kind of the whole grotesque culture of Rome. Uh, slavery, which I don't mention here, was everywhere, as we said, another common thing. Rome was a very abusive culture. It was, it was forged under the idea of dominance. Romans believed they had the will of the gods giving, making them superior to the rest of humanity. So Romans took what Romans wanted. They were dominant, they were strong, uh, and a Roman male especially. Um, the liberals today talk about toxic masculinity. Ha! Roman males Roman males took whatever they wanted, and they had a right to do so because they were Roman males. They were a privileged class. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an awful place. And it led, it led to, you know, especially, especially all of the, the grotesque sexual things, led to a, a, a spirit of objectification of other human beings. People were not people to be loved. They were objects to be used. Uh, marriage among Romans, at this time anyway, was not forged from love. Most marriages were convenience. Uh, a Roman, Roman male wanted to leave a family line. You need a woman for that. Uh, you marry her. She's basically the, the housekeeper, while the Roman male runs around and does whatever he wants to do. Uh, 
So it was a very male-dominated culture and very abusive. Uh, the Caesars, especially with their power they had, were very much into objectifying other human beings. Uh, Caligula uh, liked watching people die, as I guess Claudius did too, um, to the point of he, he liked watching the life drain out of their eyes as they died in front of them. So he would have people murdered and then walk up to them and look them in the eye and watch the life drain out. Can you imagine the kind of monster it takes to do that? Uh, Caligula held, held a, a dinner party and for entertainment had a Roman soldier who was particularly skilled at beheading come in and behead a bunch of criminals as dinner entertainment. Um, so th this huge objectification of other human beings. Caligula also, it's almost funny if it wasn't so gross, uh, at the, you know, they had the games there, the gladiatorial games, they would, they would uh, prisoners were usually executed in front of everyone as public entertainment. Well, they ran out of prisoners one day, and Caligula didn't want to be done with his public entertainment. So part of the crowd that was sitting over there watching, he commanded to be thrown in and executed for his entertainment. But he didn't want to hear them screaming, so he had their tongues cut out first, and then threw them in. Uh, you know, that's the kind of objectification of other human beings that was present in Rome. This, this was a brutal place. Imagine being a Christian living in that. So, Rome's attitude towards Christians. Uh, we, see, we saw Claudius, who rejected the Jews, but he's really rejecting Christians because it was the Jews who were instigating things because of Christ. Nero who is, is he the next one after Claudius? I always get that mixed up. 54 to 68. Claudius goes from, I had that. Claudius, where did, where did I have that? I had his years. Claudius. 37 to 41. Okay, so there's one between Claudius and Nero. Anyway, Nero, 54 to 68 A.D. Oh, it was Claudius, right, Caligulus to 41, then Claudius, then, then Nero. Okay. okay, so Claudius was 41 to 54. Right. So Nero follows Claudius. He hates Christians more than anybody does. He's the, he knew what Christianity was, despised it. He used them for scapegoats for the great fire in Rome. Here's a Roman historian, a guy by the name of Tacitus, in his annals. This is what he writes about that, uh, especially about Nero here. But all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor Nero and the propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration, that is the burning of Rome in 64 AD, was a result of an order given by Nero. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Uh, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment again, broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all Christians who pleaded guilty. Then upon their information, the immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths, Covered with skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burned, to serve as nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Ro Nero had Christians doused in tar, tied to stakes, 
and set on fire to light his garden at night for dinner parties. That's how much he hated Christians. And you see all the other things they did to Christians. And they, what did they accuse Christians of? Being haters of humanity. Can you imagine that? You know, the, the, the whole Christian message is about love and self-sacrifice. And the accusation was that we are haters of humanity. Why would they come up with an accusation like that? Well, as we said, the Christians refused to participate in Roman culture. We didn't, we didn't go to all the sporting events and all the other things and participate in the prayers to the gods. Christians also said that there was only one God. Roman culture was polytheistic, many gods. In saying that there's only one God, essentially, the Christians were saying that if you didn't worship the one true God, you were going to hell. So the Romans took that as an attack against their entire culture because they were making people feel bad and robbing them of their, uh, of their right to worship whatever God they wanted. Uh, they, were, they were putting guilt on people. So they're haters of humanity. They exist to make other people feel bad. That was the accusation. It's the same stinking thing we have today. It's the same accusation we're getting. So don't be afraid if people call you a hater because you're a Christian and say some things are right and some things are wrong. And I also think that the whole sexual thing was part of it. Christians talked about love in marriage. That wasn't a Roman way. And they talked about monogamy, about refraining from sexual intercourse if you weren't married. That was unthinkable in Roman culture for men. So it was like everything. Christianity was the exact opposite of Roman culture, and so the Romans kind of summed it all up with accusing them of being haters of humanity. And they paid a price. Next asterisk. Christians were also accused of cannibalism, e even, even accused of eating babies and of incest. They were accused of incest because the early Christians called each other brother and sister. And then when they met for worship, they would close the doors to keep the outside world out while they worshiped. And so the rumor was their brothers and sisters in behind closed doors doing who knows what, what each, with each other. You know, because that's what the rest of the Roman culture was doing. They must be having orgies in there because the rest of the Roman culture was doing that. So that's the adultery. The eating babies thing comes from the, the Lord's Supper. We eat the body and blood of Christ. They're cannibals, and it's probably worse than just cannibals to adults. They're probably eating babies, too. You know, it, it's crazy how the rumor mill was out of control in Rome, but it's exactly the same thing we face today. Uh, and despite it all, the church grew. That's the amazing thing. Despite the vicious rumors and the hatred being heaped on Christians, Christianity grew at this point in time because people were understanding that it, it, it actually has love. It actually sets you free from guilt. There's actually a savior to, to save you from all this filth and objectification of other people and hatred. You know, there were those the Holy Spirit worked on and turned to the faith and saved because it was so different and didn't yield to the dominant culture. You know, and that's a lesson for us, too. Uh, we don't have to fit in and be liked in this culture. The fact that we are so different and hated is the very vehicle the Holy Spirit will use to bring people to Christ because they will see we offer something unique from the world. It's a, it's a great example. Any thoughts or comments? We got, we got, they're going to pull the screen on me here in a few minutes. So the, the next section is going to take more than a few minutes. So we'll pick it up there next time. But, you know, you think you've got it bad now being a Christian? Imagine living in Rome. Uh, and this persisted. Uh, the next section we'll go through. This wasn't just a Nero thing. Nero, Nero really started the viciousness against Christians, but it doesn't end until the 300s. You know, 250 years of some of the most vicious persecution 
and yet Christianity grew. It's, it's an absolute miracle. The more they tried to stamp it out, the more it grew. The more they killed Christians, the more people converted. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. It really shows that conversion is not up to us. Mm -hmm. It shows the hand of God in it and the work of the Holy Spirit. It, it went completely against prevailing logic. There's, there were martyrs, um, just, what, what was it, 10 years ago or so, not even, where there were a bunch of Coptic Christians lined up and beheaded by ISIS. And, and, and one of those was not a Coptic Christian, but a convert on the spot. That basically ISIS came in, went through this town, asked, if, are you a Christian? And everybody who said yes was killed. So these men, I think there was like 18 of them, said yes, we're Christians. And they were lining them up, and they got to this other guy. They said, are you a Christian? And he said, I want to follow the God these men follow that are willing to die for it. He saw, he saw in them courage and bravery and, and love. And he didn't know a whole lot about Christianity other than the fact that this Jesus person had given them such courage and, would, and they trusted in, the, in his power to resurrect them and they believed that he was the Son of God. That's all he knew. And he said, I, I want to stand with them. And he was lined up with them and beheaded with them. But just, that's, that's how the Holy Spirit works. Through their witness of strength in the face of death and unyielding courage that Christ can resurrect me, it doesn't matter what the world does to me. That converts. That's what the Holy Spirit uses. So don't fear what the world can do to you just because you confess Christ. All right, let's close. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the courage that you have given to Christians in the past and pray that you might visit us with that same spirit. Strengthen us in our faith and help us confess you before this world that has turned against you. For Jesus' sake, amen.